So the core offer, we're going to go in and we're going to uh, build an offer around the product itself. There's a big difference, again, between product and offer here. And this is, this is really it. Um, when I was uh, at Jeff Walker's thing, I was sitting down there, <clears throat> and I always hated it when people would stand up and say, all right, go say hi to the neighbor next to you. Be honest, how many of you guys going to hate that? I do too, okay? <laughs> so the guy that turns around is sitting right in front of me. He turns right around. He says, hey, how's it going? And he, yeah, I could tell he was like, oh, you know. <laughs> and I was like, eh. And uh, <coughs> turns out it was Dan Kennedy's ghostwriter. And so we had a chance to chat and talk. And he's like, wait, you do that? And I was like, wait, you do that? And I was like, oh, cool. And it was like this little friend marriage right there. And, you know, so we've been... We've been chatting back and forth, and he helped ghostwrite uh, magnetic marketing for Dan Kennedy, and he's, one of, he's his head copywriter for all the sales letters. And so we've been chatting, and we talk back and forth, and we've been emailing back and forth, and we got a cool relationship going on. His name's Jack Turk, and he wrote a great book. Um, let me see if it, uh, yeah, next slider here. Okay, 101 Fast, Good, Cheap Hacks to Writing a Killer Sales Letter by Jack Turk. So I was reading his book. I took a picture of me reading it to keep the relationship going. I sent it over to him, and we were chatting. And I was like, dude, this part was really amazing. He said, thanks. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of glad you like that. And what he said was offer equals, this is literally the formula he had in there, offer equals core product plus value add. This is the book that it comes from, and that was uh, me chatting with him over there. <clears throat> Under that story, I make you guys say hi to each other now, <laughs> even though I'm not a fan of it either. <laughs> you never know when you're going to meet someone like that, right? So anyway, so in order to take a product, a core product, and turn it into an offer, we're going to go add more value. And there's multiple ways to go do that. So I'm actually gonna take a little bit of a, uh, a chunk right here and we're gonna walk through things that increase value, okay? Very easy mechanisms you can go pull off in order to turn this thing into an offer itself, okay? So just real fast though, how do you think most people create their offers right now? They add info products. Add info products, what else? What's that? So oh, funnel scripts, yeah, 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 definitely, how else? They had a coaching call, a consulting call. How else? What else? A wing and a prayer. A wing and a prayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good to see you, by the way. <laughs> yes. The same thing packaged a different way. Audio book, transcripts. Same thing packaged a different way. And does it work? Yeah. It does work, right? Uh, what else? Inside offer lab. Inside, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what else? Product bundling. Product bundling, definitely. And what I want you to see is that the approach to offer creation Usually what, they, uh, what most people take is um, more stuff. There's more ways to add value than just more stuff. More stuff does not mean more value. That's what I'm actually gonna walk through with you is multiple ways to cause more value. Uh, when I left, I want you guys to know where this comes from. When I left the job, I didn't have this stuff. I didn't, the only thing I had um, is I had a framework and I had been developing it for the, about six months before I left. And there's a very specific framework I started putting together. This is actually where it comes from. I started realizing because of these fat events that I was helping run, these fun hackathons, I started realizing that the things that were in Expert Secrets and Dotcom Secrets, they're obviously brilliant. But there were certain scenarios people were in. Well, I'm in this business. Well, I'm in that business. I'm in this stage of entrepreneurship versus the stage you were in, Russell, when you wrote it. Does that make sense? I was like, I need to take this and I need to adapt it so it actually works for anyone in any business. And so what I started doing was putting together a framework. And on my whiteboards, back in my home office, this is what I started drawing. Okay, this is the core offer formula. And the reason it works is because it doesn't come from me, it comes from the market. And it allows me to create a sales message and an offer at the exact same time, which we know is, is huge. Okay, the formula that this is following though is the more stuff equals more value mindset. So I wanna teach you a few other ways because every once in a while, I'll get somebody who's like, I really can't go add more things to this. How many guys are selling somebody else's product and taking a commission? Sometimes it's hard to do that, right? In those scenarios, or sometimes it might be hard if you're in software and you're like, it's gonna take me six months to get it back from the dev guys in order to make those changes, right? You're like, oh man, so I want, this is why I'm walking you through this, is to see the other things that uh, actually cause and add value to an offer. So we're talking about this part right here. We're gonna talk about the left side as well, but right now we're gonna talk about that right part there. Oops, uh, call that your core offer and uh, kind of those methodologies that come there. So this is how value is created. Um, back to Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons he was so 
um, confrontational <laughs> back in the time, you know, 16, 1700s. Uh, he goes in and uh, he, the, the main belief back in that day is that value was created, the value that's out there, value was based on how long I took to make it. What's the problem with that? You don't buy your own stuff. What else? What else is wrong if I say it's worth this because I spent this much time on it? Someone else could do less time, I'd be the same product. Yeah, absolutely. What's that? What else? Trading time for money. Trading time for money, right? There's, there's, there's no way. It's very hard to be entrepreneurial that way. Thought definitely. I heard some. Maybe not. Okay, so <clears throat> what he did is he's one of the first people to ever come out and say, value is not determined by how long it took you to make it. Value is determined by the end user. Value is determined in the eyes of the beholder, right? And, and if I go out and I say, it, it took me five days to make this amazing thing, but it doesn't actually solve a legitimate issue, it's not valuable, right? And this was one of the biggest things that actually started influencing European reform when that was all going on is there in, in their economics and such. It's really fascinating. So value is created but it's created in the eyes of the beholder. It's in the eyes of the customer. It doesn't matter how, much you, how cool you think it is, right? So is that, is that kind of interesting? It's a helpful, hopefully, because it's under that lens that we go in and we can start creating value on top of the core product to turn it to an offer, okay? So I'm gonna rifle through several ways here to turn a product into an offer. Now, the first way is the way that you guys have all been talking about. It's the way that uh, you guys have all seen multiple times. The idea is to take a core product and then add stuff, right? Just more stuff. Product, 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 bonus, 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 bonus. And that's a great way to do it. That's a great way to do it. You certainly increase the value of something and uh, justify the price that you're selling to. Is that the only way though? No. That's definitely not. Okay. Uh, like I said, some of you guys are in different scenario and such. So let me keep going through some of these. How many of you guys have seen the fake book story? <laughs> <laughs> kind of become an industry thing now, <laughs> right? How many of you guys bought it? The book? <laughs> Yeah, if you guys, <laughs> you, guys yeah. <laughs> you bought it more than once. <laughs> How many knew it was fake and you bought it again? <laughs> Dave Woodward did that. <laughs> okay. Um, but what happens with this? We take a core product. Now, what's, what's interesting is every time I've done this, in fact, the first time I did it, I didn't tell anyone I was going to do it. And uh, so the room is running around in the back trying to figure out, like, what's he selling? Do you have the link? Where's the drop? He's not allowed to do this. Does Russell know? Like, oh, like, I started freaking out. But what's funny is in that story, I noticed something very powerful while I was doing it on stage. I've done it probably 10 times on stage now just, to, just for fun. It illustrates the point. How many of you guys have not seen it, just so I know? Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, we, uh, we got some homework for you. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> um, we'll show it during a break. <laughs> Okay, um, I've, I've chunked it down to like a five minute thing. So I'll show a video of it. Um, but what's interesting is that when I stand up and I tell the story, nice ran, I shoved my hand in the door and then I asked the guy, how'd you get that? Right, and I'm lying my face off and no one knows, right? And I'm going in, I'm telling the story. When I finally say, this is that book, when is the buying emotion created? When I hold that up, or when I start saying, plus you'll get the audio, plus you'll get this, plus you'll get this. The moment I hold it up. So what caused the value? The story. That's when I realized, oh my gosh, value isn't just created by more stuff. The story itself can turn and something into a core product and actually be the value add. Because then I, I value the book more than the $17 book, or $17 or whatever, 17 buck, uh, bucks <laughs> that I'm going to go pay in order to go grab that. Does that make sense? That's really big. It's one of the biggest reasons we tell the story because it increases the value of the core product itself and we'll turn it into an offer. All right now, there was a few people who've asked like, well, how do I use what you're doing? Steven, I'm in, I'm in multi-million dollar, multi-stage, massive corporate to corporate level sales. I'm not gonna walk around and plus you'll get this and you'll get this and you'll get this. You know what I mean? I was like, but they're right. You know, I was like, okay, to match that sales style, like that doesn't actually make that sense to do it that way. But that still is applicable. I could still go tell a story, right, for some corporate client and increase the value and turn my product into an offer in that way still. Does that make sense? And so this is how you go do that in scenarios like that. Now, my encouragement is that as I start going through these, hopefully you do all of them. And then people are like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, right? 
Hopefully go do all of them, but just one of them has the capacity when done right to turn a product into an offer. Okay. Next, guarantee. I love this quote. <clears throat> and I know some of you guys have seen part of this piece here, but this quote um, is from Claude Hopkins. This is in uh, Scientific Advertising, I believe. He said, two men came to me, each offering a horse. Both made equal claims. They were good horses, kind and gentle. A child could drive them. One man said, here's the offer. Try the horse for a week. If my claims are not true, come back for your money. Okay, so what's his offer? You got like a seven day guarantee, right? Basically. Then he said, the other man also said, try the horse for a week. But then he added, come and pay me then. I naturally bought the second man's horse. Wait a second. Same product, the horse. Both are saying, try it for a week. One saying, pay now. The other one saying, pay at the end of the time. What's causing the value here? No risk. There's no risk. The guarantee itself is causing additional value. I never thought of it that way. I always thought like, oh man, the guarantee is something I need to put in there, a 30 day money back guarantee. But the reality is, is that the guarantee when done correctly actually adds value to the offer. Any Tim Ferriss fans in here? Did you ever read the four hour work week? Anybody? Oh my gosh, that book is so good. In that book, he has a case study where he says, he had a product, a supplement called Brain Quicken. And um, I wish I had the stats pulled up here with what he said. But basically, the standard refund rate on a supplement like that was like 12 to 15%. And everyone's guarantee was the same. 30-day money-back guarantee. He's like, man, I wonder if there's a way I can like add more value with this. So what he did is he said, 90-day money-back guarantee. And I'll give you 110% of your money back if it doesn't work in the first 90 minutes crazy. That's what's called a lose-win guarantee. They're very powerful. What do you think happened? Meaning he's going to pay them 10% more than they, they paid if they have to give the money back. What do you think happened? The sales increased. Why would the sales increase? Why is there no risk? You can make money. You can make money on it. What does that do to their heads though? Oh my gosh, this person is so confident they will give me money? That level of confidence will just shoot your sales up like crazy. Um, he said that there's a few people that did take advantage of it, but his sales, um, I think it tripled in, nine, in 30 days. Sales tripled and funny enough, his refund rate went down from the standard 12% down to like five. His refund rate actually went down and sales went up because of the amount of uh, confidence he was exuding in his guarantee. So if you can start looking through this, um, another example he gives in there just so you have it, um, uh, t-shirts, right? He has a guy who goes and sells these t-shirts and basically the guarantee is I'll give you 200%, I think it was this, I'll give you 200% your money back uh, if it's not the softest shirt you've ever worn in your life. That was it. And sales went ballistic and a few people refunded, but way more than the sales you would have made if it didn't have that kind of guarantee. Okay, so start thinking about ways that you can create a, a, not just a guarantee, it's a lose-win guarantee that makes the customer feel like they get to take advantage of you if you don't get to deliver up, okay? And that, that is a massive way to explode your sales. Cool? It's one of my favorite ones, okay? <coughs> All right, the next one here. Um, definitely scarcity and urgency actually increases the value of stuff. Okay, because of something not being available as long, it gets taken off and actually increases the value of a product. Funny enough, just by having scarcity and urgency, we can take a product and increase its value and turn it into an offer. Any questions on that one? A lot of these I'm gonna start going faster. <laughs> cool. Next one, um, high perceived ROI. Okay, high perceived ROI. What's the, what's, what's um, so as far as like a high perceived ROI, what I mean with this is like, uh, if you go in and you see Russell, for example, right? He'll probably pitch something at Funnel Hacking Live, right? It would be very un-Russell of him to do that, right? <laughs> if he didn't, right? And so uh, he's probably gonna pitch something there. And what he's gonna do is he will go in and show you how you can increase your revenues because of this thing, beyond what it is that you, beyond what you pay, right? That's the strategy with that. Um, we call that sometimes in copywriting a then versus now, right? I do it a lot of times and I'm like, then I was sucking it up. Now, very different, right? Call that a then versus now. We get an easy way to do uh, with case studies, right? Um, 
Um, I'm trying to think of one of the, my examples. Oh, <laughs> writing an ebook for students about how to get straight A's. That's sucky, right? <laughs> That's terrible. Don't do that, right? That's a then versus now, right? I could go in and tell the story about how I wrote a different book to um, a different audience, and now that book actually worked, right? And now I'm going to teach you how to do the exact same thing. So the high perceived ROI, return on your investment itself, and how they get their money back. That's, that's a big one. We did this um, for OfferMind. Um, I wanted to have a high perceived ROI offer, which means I'm going to plan in the offer ways for people to recoup the cost of the ticket. And so what we did is we made people a special affiliate. We said, hey, if you want to go s get the money back, just ask like a person or two to come on in and you'll get the cost of your ticket back. So we, we built in a way for them to pay for it in the offer. Make sense? Those are really cool strategies. Hey, you can pull this off. And then people are like, oh, well, why wouldn't I do this? That's, it'd be dumb for me not to. You're like, exactly, right? It's a high perceived ROI. That's a fun one. Uh, custom results. Um, some of my favorite case studies are of uh, funnels that have been launched where they go do all the work that we've talked about, right? They go create the message. They create the offer. They go do the funnel. They put together the sales letter. They go launch, 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 launch. They make all this money, which is really great. They shut down the cart because you should always do that. They shut down the cart. And then they just focus on making their existing clients very successful and capture everyone's testimonial. And then they'll go reopen, they'll go reopen the sales cart with no sales letter, no offer, basically hardly anything else in there except for a massive page of testimonials. Just scrolling down, just tons, tons and tons and tons. They'll do as much money on the relaunch with just testimonials as they did on the first launch with a sales letter. Okay, this is super powerful to understand with this. Um, um, anyway, customer results, that's a huge way to increase the value of a, a, current, uh, a product or offer. Questions then? All right, let me keep going here. Sweet. Success is the number one selling feature. Anyone read the uh, book Behind the Cloud? Such a good book. Oh my gosh, such a good book. This is the story, if you don't know, uh, this is the story of basically how Cloudflare, not Cloudflare, <laughs> Salesforce. <laughs> Think of Cloudflare. <laughs> This is a cloud. Anyone use Cloudflare? <laughs> um, this is basically the story behind how Salesforce became a billion dollar company very quickly and just exploded out of nowhere. Um, super good book. Russell had the whole ClickFunnels company read it together at once and start studying, they call them plays. So we started studying the plays that they ran, which is really cool. It's a great book. I recommend it for everyone to read. It's great. But uh, in there, it says success is the number one selling feature. So if you have something that's been successful and you've never documented, again, a case study of something like that, it's time to go in and start. Like, there's a reason why I will go in and sometimes on my podcast episodes, I go and I'm bringing in success stories of people I've coached. It's because that is much more convincing of a sales letter than if I actually wrote a sales letter. Someone kind of ties into the one before. But... Uh, Anyway, success is the number one selling feature. So one of, the, one of the best things you can do ever, like the first time I launched a secret MLM hacks, um, I, had a, I had a beta group of 30 people that got it for free because I wanted to test like Play-Doh, right? I'm testing back and forth on them. And they knew that. So their role, the only reason they got it for free is if they were brutal in their feedback. I, I, this is what I told them. You need to be pretty much rude to me and tell me what it is that's wrong with this. And so that's what we did. And I was able to go in and grab uh, a lot of case studies of people who pulled it off and it worked and it was great. Oh, this works, that doesn't. This, this works, but it, it didn't make sense the way I explained it. All right, cool, don't explain it that way that time. And so by the time I actually launched it and polished, I did have that when I left ClickFunnels. I had that data, I had that, that insight already. Um, but that's, this is a big piece. Cool. All righty. Uh, you guys already mentioned this one. Uh, info in another way. Um, yeah, there's not a lot more to say that one. <laughs> info in another way. <laughs> Any questions with this one? Anyone, ever, anyone do this or pull this one off? I'll tell you what, yeah, it, one of the most standard plays that we run, I think of this like football plays a lot of times when it's about campaigns. One of the standard plays that we run is um, when I'm doing affiliate stuff or I'm trying to create leads and noise in my market or click funnels and I'm promoting some of their stuff, I'll go film like a two or three hour thing uh, live, and then we take it and we transcribe it, now it's an ebook, rip the audio, now it's an audio book, right? And we just, we change the way that it's consumed. There's an interesting phenomenon when it comes to content, the, con the platform is the preframe, 
right? If you read a blog, how many guys read blogs? It's awesome. How many guys uh, prefer watching YouTube videos? How many guys, uh, what about iTunes? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we give way more authority to things like video usually and writing than we do things like, um, like if I was to say the exact same stuff I'm saying right here in front of you, one-on-one, face-to-face, way less valuable, same content. Really interesting. So we go in and we'll take things and we change it to the platform that causes a lot of authority. Um, same stuff, just so people treat it like it should be treated. <laughs> okay. Next, community. Community is a big one. <clears throat> no one wants to feel alone. No one truly is, but no one wants to feel alone on their journey. And so we'll go in and we'll say, hey, you get access to the community or you get access to uh, myself or you get access to, right? This is, a, this is a great, very fun one to pull off. Um, Russell just closed his mastermind and I've uh, been a part of it for a while and I felt the loss. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, not so much. Like, I just got felt the loss in the community. And so I immediately started looking for other masterminds. And so I went and I joined um, a mastermind with, um, with uh, Pat Flynn and Ezra Firestone and a few others. And they're like, hey, you want to get on the monthly calls to me? It's not that valuable. I don't really want to do that. So, but what is valuable to me is the community and the meetups where I physically get to be in the same room with people, right? That is all proximity is power. Holy smokes. I learned so much like that. That's the community piece is huge. So if you can find a way to add a community aspect, even if it's a Facebook group, Word to the wise on this one, though, don't call it a Facebook group. Devalues it because they know what it is. Call it a community, and it just happens to be a Facebook group. Okay, <clears throat> renaming of the same thing. Some other kind of tangible. Uh, when we were launching the uh, marketing in your car, have any, anyone uh, marketing in your car dot com? Anyone been there? The MP3 player. Anyone go buy it? Yeah, yeah, right? That's literally info in another way, but it's also a tangible. You can go listen to the whole podcast for free on iTunes. Instead, we went and we took that thing, we repackaged it another way, we made a tangible out of it that we go and we ship out. I always make sure I ship something out on pretty much anything they buy from me if it's the middle of the top of the value ladder. I always ship something, whether it's a workbook or a hat or something, because what happens is we find that, <clears throat> I actually learned this from, uh, do you guys have a Funnel Hacker t-shirt? Is most your closet black? <laughs> <laughs> My wife was like, you literally have half your closet is black t-shirts. I was like, it's the unofficial uniform of the internet, babe. <laughs> this, <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, what we started finding out is that when people would get the Funnel Hacker t-shirt with the trial of ClickFunnels, a lot of them would go put it on, and we found out a lot of them never logged into ClickFunnels but didn't cancel it either. They felt so tied because of the shirt. We closed them. There's something to that. A lot of times you'll see realtors do the exact same thing when they know that you're, they got you kind of close, send you cookies, right? Or send you something in the mail because there's something to consuming or feeding or clothing your people. And so there's a huge amount of value that comes from that. Uh, strongly encourage everyone to figure out some tangible, something that you can send to them that is involved either in your onboarding process or maybe it's a big lead system and it's a high ticket thing or whatever it is. Something that you can clothe them or feed them or something like that in that process, like instant value, very, very powerful. So they found that it's just a lot. That's one of the reasons why Russell makes so many shirts. We found that out and we were like, holy crap, how many is it? A lot, okay, it's a lot of people. We're like, you should probably log into ClickFunnels, but I mean, if you wanna keep sending us $97 a month, all right, I mean, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna stop you. Here's another shirt, you know? <laughs> they don't cost 97 bucks, here you go. So. Uh, that principle, though, is very, very powerful. And if there's ways you can work that into your, your product and turn to an offer that way, it's huge also. Uh, coaching itself, very, very huge. Um, there's a massive power to this, to be able to log in or, or chat with somebody face-to-face, -to, -face, to just say, hi, I have this question. Hi, I need this validated. In fact, most of the time I found, again, that most off people's offers are good enough. There's a lot of stuff we can change to them. You'll see that in a moment here. Uh, but the other thing that's really happening is they just want validation. It's not about, is the offer good enough or bad enough? They just hey, am I nuts for thinking this, right? I went to the crazy zone, Stephen. Is this okay? And that, this, is, this is huge. I strongly encourage you, though, if you are doing kind of middle of the value ladder stuff, do not put in one-on-one -on -one coaching as a bonus. <clears throat> there was a lady we were doing stuff with. She was like, hey, I'm just wondering how everyone else is pulling this off. I, I, I decided to do an onboarding call with everybody, and I was like, oh, for like a $1,000 thing? I was like, hopefully you sell a 1,000 of them. 
That's a thousand hours. Your life just ended, right? <laughs> Don't do that, right? So instead, especially when it's a middle of the value ladder thing and it's going to be high volume, uh, we instead supplement this with uh, group coaching. So you say, get on. This is going to be my live Q&A coaching calls. Uh, it's group coaching. So you can get on and see. I, we're marketers, right? So I say, you're going to get on. You're going to see how I um, answer other people's questions, which there's tremendous value in. Um, so that's how we say it. So that they still get their questions answered, but it's not going to, your life's over, <laughs> right? Take you to the grave. Um, one of the things I do with this also is we will go and um, everything's repurposable, right? So when we do group Q&As, we always record them. And after about three or four months, um, I did this. I was like, dude, Russell, we have 200 hours of Q&A with me and other people. What if we went and we sent this to a guy to go chop up every time a question is asked and my answer to its own individual video? And we could put it in an FAQ section. He was like, oh my gosh. So we sent over this guy in Singapore and he went and he chop, 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 named all the files, the questions and my answer, put it inside there. And then we load it inside an FAQ section. So then you go and you log in and it's like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Um, and then we can say, like, if you ask something, 99%, it's already been asked and answered. And they can just go through and, and search through and scroll. That was a huge value add, massive value add uh, to people to have that already all logged in there. It's a good one. Anyone going to go do that? It's really nice. How many of you guys are doing group Q&A right now? Just record it and after a while, batch send it to somebody and chop it up and it's, that's a massive thing to add in your stack slides. New identity. Every purchase should include an identity shift. That should be the purchase. Okay? What identity do I give people on checkout? Capitalist pig. What else? Maverick, yep, absolutely. What else? Real marketer. Real marketer. That is one that I hit so hard, which makes you think, there's a fake marketer? <laughs> it's part of it. That's why, that's why half the reason it works so well. But yeah, real marketer, that's a, that's a big one. Um, <clears throat> if you can come up with a name of your tribe, people, uh, anyone ever read the book uh, Tribe by Seth Godin's Tribes? It's a great book. In there he says, never in the history of the world, has there ever been so much detribing in humanity? People are begging to be led. People are begging to be part of a tribe. People are begging to come together. There's never been so much desegregation ever, just all over the place, and people just detribing. Okay, so much isolation in the world now. People want a leader, and if you're willing to stand up and be part of that, you're going to have a lot of value for your communities. So come up with a name. Um, Capos Pig, I actually didn't come up with that. Russell did not come up with a funnel hacker. Um, he just taught a principle. What, what is funnel hacking, honestly? Modeling. Did he come up with modeling? No. And I said, hey, <clears throat> you know what's interesting what you did? He just took something that's like a very general principle, follow people who are successful, and he gave it a cool name. He's like, I know, cool, huh? <laughs> and then about a few months in, suddenly someone started saying, we're funnel hackers. We went and we got this, and he's like, oh, that's kind of cute and clever. Sounds good. That's it. That's how it came about. Capitalist pig, that actually came from Ryan Moran. Um, not from him, but I saw him wear a shirt that said Capitalist Pig that was yellow. And I was like, we could remake that enough so that it's not plagiarizing. Yeah, now let's go make it red. Let's put a little ear with, and like the eye's gonna be a dollar sign. Boom, <laughs> okay, done. So find a way that you can go and create a tribe that people can identify with. They want that, people, people need that. We all need that. We're all looking for connection. I'll actually talk about that a little bit more uh, in the future here. Okay, but this is all of them in one shot if you, need, if you wanna see them. This is certainly not all of them either, but these are the ways to, uh, these are very easy kind of rinse and repeat ways to create value inside of offers beyond just adding more stuff, which is still a viable thing, which is still great. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment.